President Obama, we've been talking about this all morning, turning his back on Israel and breaking decades-old policy, but not by not vetoing a U.N. resolution condemning controversial Israeli settlements in disputed Palestinian territory. New York Congressman Lee Zeldin is here now to weigh in. Congressman Zeldin, are you surprised that we kind of stiffed Israel on this because this is the same administration that decided Israel's uh, great enemy in the Middle East, Iran, should be our friend? Well, we should be surprised, uh, but you know, over the course of the last few months and weeks, there was this talk about possibly between the election and the next administration taking over that uh, President Obama might uh, not use our veto authority at the UN. Uh, this resolution that was passed yesterday is a, an anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic resolution. Uh, President Obama is colluding with a, a Hamas Abbas pro-Palestinian effort to essentially I mean, eth ethnically cleanse eastern Jerusalem and uh, Judea Samaria region. Uh, so a lot of American, most Americans, most of Congress, even a lot of the Democratic Party. I mean, it's just there, there's a revolt. It's not the will of the people for a president. Well, I know you supporters. disagree with the president, but those strong words, an anti-Semitic resolution. But you're, you're essentially ethnically cleansing an area. I mean, th this is Han Hanukkah starts this evening. Yeah. And the story of the Maccabees is they were living, fighting, praying, working in an area that this UN resolution is saying that uh, Jews aren't going to be able to settle. Yeah. Uh, so it, it says also Jews can't pray at the Western Wall. It's uh, and uh, you know in boycotting uh, economic products that might be manufactured there. Uh, th this is I mean, some people on the left are saying that uh, these settlements are illegal, and that's just not true. Uh, and you know they, they are misinterpreting UN resolutions, Geneva Conventions. They're trying to interpret it in a way, playing on the fact that a lot of people don't know all of the details of all these revolu re resolutions and conventions. Playing on that fact, they're trying to spin this in a way as if this was already illegal. No, it was actually the resolution yesterday that for the first time they're making that statement. So what does this mean going forward? Because obviously President-elect Donald Trump is in in just a matter of weeks. He's voiced his opinion, obviously very upset about this, saying he's going to work with, with Benjamin Netanyahu moving forward and this will be a new chapter. But the vote was already cast yesterday. What does that mean going forward? Is this something that could be changed? Does this change policy from here? How are you thinking about it? Well, we're going to have to clean up a lot of damage, and it should be noted that President Obama still has just less than four weeks left in office, so it's possible that he might do something else, whether it's domestic or foreign policy, that says further back. Uh, I don't believe that we should be funding the Palestinian Authority. Uh, we should not be funding any efforts to implement a resolution like this. Uh, it should be further noted, I mean, the Palestinian Authority, they financially reward families mm. for being imprisoned for terrorizing innocent Israelis. Well, let's final uh, point because we've got 30 seconds on talking about funding. Donald Trump tweeted yesterday, there's going to be a new sheriff in town on January 20th. Do you think finally, you hear this from some of your Republican colleagues like Lindsey Graham, that there might be an effort that is actually successful this time to cut off U.S. funds to the United Nations? Uh, very likely that the support is growing. There, there was always some support. I would say now there's even more support. So uh, that, that's a growing possibility with the United Nations acting in a way against our allies, uh, our strongest allies, Israel. Nikki Haley's going to have a lot on her plate. Absolutely. She gets well, into that role. Congressman Lee Zeldin. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah starts tonight, Hanukkah. as you said. Thank you. Thanks. Together, we will raise incomes and bring jobs and wealth and opportunity to our poorest communities. We will repeal the disaster known as Obamacare and create new health care, all sorts of reforms that work for you and your family. I am asking Congress to support the construction of new roads, bridges, airports, tunnels, and railways all across our nation. We're going to do it. My administration will be focused on three very important words, jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, that was President-elect Donald Trump on his thank you tour laying out part of his agenda. Joining us now is the author of the best-selling book, Treason, former Speaker of the House and Fox News contributor Newt Gingrich. So, Mr. Gingrich, what would Newt Gingrich's advice be to President-elect Donald Trump over this next couple of weeks, this, this break, this holiday break? What should he be looking to do get accomplished? Well, I think, first of all, he needs to finish filling out the 
key jobs that he's recruiting people for. It's an enormous undertaking, not just the cabinet and the sub-cabinet, but about 4,000 jobs altogether. So that's inevitably going to take part of his time. He needs to start thinking about his inaugural address. It'll be one of the most important moments of his entire presidency. It gives people a chance to see who he is and how he thinks and what his values are. So it's a very, very important speech. Uh, he needs to keep talking to foreign leaders, keep building, opening up those relationships, uh, because that's a new thing for him. And I think that he uh, has to think through how he wants to handle Inauguration Week. He's going to be very busy. Uh, they're going to have an enormous crowd here to see the inaugural. Uh, and Calista and I are certainly looking forward to it. It's going to be just great. Uh, but at the same time, that's a time to get some things done, to uh, repeal executive orders, uh, to talk with the Congress about passing some big legislation, to make sure that his uh, various cabinet picks are going to get through the, co the Senate. So he'll have a lot to do in the next three or four weeks. Talk to us a little bit about that inaugural address. What do you, what do you expect to hear? What type, of, uh, what type of tone? What's the message? Well... <laughs> I mean, first of all, who knows that he's the president-elect, he gets to write the address he wants. But I think he made so much of making America great again. It was so central to his campaign that, that I have a hunch you're going to see that come back up. And I think he's going to talk, if I was guessing, uh, and I clearly am because I don't know, I think he'll talk about making America great again. He'll talk about the role of Americans in making America great again. And he'll talk about the idea, I think, that that greatness should not only apply to all Americans, but that hopefully the world will see, and watching us and in participating with us, uh, that every human being can be great again, and that you don't have to have the kind of organization that cuts off people's heads, uh, because you know you can do it through the pursuit of happiness. You can do it through free enterprise. You can do it because free people are allowed to work together. It's the exact opposite of ISIS and their effort to rule by terror. Uh, I hope he's going to give that kind of a visionary, relatively brief speech. Uh, I think John F. Kennedy's speech, for example, was only 1,800 words. Uh, so r the inaugural should be relatively brief, moral, visionary, clear language. And then a couple weeks later, you go up to the joint session. You have a much longer, more boring speech. Uh, but they're two different kinds of commodities. Gotcha. Um, one of the most important uh, initiatives, things that Donald Trump will have to do right away, and when should he do this? When should he nominate someone for the Supreme Court? Oh, I, I would think within a week or two. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if he did it the first day. Uh, he has the list. Uh, it's a list that they thought about very carefully before they put it out. Anyone on that list is going to be an outstanding choice. Uh, I know uh, that he is uh, thinking about it, talking to people about it. He's going to make a very good choice, a very solid choice. Uh, and I think that person uh, will get through because I think they'll be so respected. This was a list of winners of people with great, great judicial reputations. And there's not a single weak person on that list. And I think conservatives will be ecstatic when they see that uh, we're going to have an opportunity here for Justice Scalia's seat to be filled by somebody who shares Justice Scalia's sound conservative principles. Mm -hmm. um, he, and he doesn't even have to wait until he's uh, sworn in to, to at least nominate someone, uh, clearly, as, as he's doing now. Some of the initiatives that he'll have to, t to undertake in, the, I guess, the first 100 days or so, or not, the, let's go through them. Jobs, Obamacare, uh, repeal or replace, immigration and taxes, what should be the priority? Well, I think, first of all, for the success of the entire administration, uh, as he said in a speech recently, there were three words that characterized the goal of his administration. Jobs, jobs, jobs. He got it right. Uh, if this economy picks up, if we, if we take the Trump rally on the stock market and we turn it into a Trump reality in the economy, uh, he's going to do very, very well, and he's going to win a big victory in 2018 in the Senate, and then he's going to win re-election in 2020. If he doesn't do that, if we don't have a real focus on economic opportunity, then I think we'll be in trouble. But everything I'm seeing, the kind of cabinet he's creating, uh, the things they're looking at for deregulation, uh, the approach they're taking with uh, Paul Ryan uh, and, and uh, with the Ways and Means Committee, all those things to me say that he knows he's got to pass a tax bill that's very pro-jobs. He's got to eliminate a lot of the regulation that's killing jobs. That's got to be his number one focus. Uh, number two, I think he has to control immigration, right. period. Well, that so was on, the on issue that, that, that propelled him to the top. 
On that note, Mr. Speaker, give us a date. When does that first shovel go into the ground for building the wall? Well, I suspect it'll go into the ground probably in April. I think he's, you know, he'll make the proposal uh, certainly by early February. They'll have to get it through the House and Senate. There's actually some money they could re uh, repurpose. Uh, and it'll be interesting to watch because remember, Donald Trump is not a financier. He's not a guy who sat down on Wall Street and invested money. Donald Trump's a builder. He's a guy who built big buildings. He worked with crews. He knows how to get down there with blue-collar workers. He knows how to have on-the-job inspection. Uh, I suspect this will be the Donald Trump project. He'll know how to do it. Uh, I think uh, the, the other piece then, if you're going to have jobs and taxes, then you're going to have immigration. The third piece will be to build a new and a dramatically better health system uh, to replace Obamacare with something which increases choice, which increases flexibility, which puts you, the American, in charge of your life working with your doctor instead of some bureaucrat. And I think, uh, I know, because I've been talking to people in the House and Senate, tremendous effort underway. Uh, Dr. Tom Price is going to be a great Secretary right. of Health and Human Services. Uh, they are right. really leaning forward in that area, and uh, they're going to do good things. All right, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.